Let him go. What I will do again, as I already told you, it will not be high cinema theory, just to make a point about <coughs> a very naive thing, a very naive ethical point I want to make, but I think it's important. How to, you know, like the problem with pacifism, how to do our fight. If you fight, you have to kill, and so on, and so on. It's very naive what I will say. But at the same, the difficult thing is that either how to avoid one extreme, which is this pure, simple patriotism, or our cause is the right one. You know, and you know this is typical. I don't know Soviet films or Western against the Germans. You don't break. Like, how we can do? We can. On, then you have the opposite, but, I, but the opposite is also false for me. This kind of a general pacifism, you know, who every killing is bad, if you fight back you become the same as your enemy and so on. And when I hear this, I always say to the people, okay, I mean a very primitive point, okay, would you say this in Europe in 1941? No. Let's not resist Hitler because we will become <laughs> the same as him and so on. So, first film. Uh, sorry, uh, this line of argumentation, I want to present it as part of, you will get the text that I promised you in two days, uh, that, because I talked too much, we didn't have time to present it, about the function of frame. Frame in the sense of. I like those moments where you are, as it were, on the edge, when things get too intense, in the sense, in what sense? In this sense. For Lacan, you probably know, he says, there is no reality without fantasy. That's very important for Lacan. And he doesn't mean it in any stupid subjectivist way, you know, like, oh, there is no reality, we just fantasize it. No. There is the real. There are things out. His point is only that the way we act in daily life, we never directly approach things the way they are. You always, I'm almost tempted to use here the philosophical term, transcendentally constitute reality. You perceive reality within certain coordinates, which are not only cognitive coordinates, like what you perceive, what you don't perceive, but even coordinates of, I don't know, suffering, pain, and so on. And uh, what I'm, uh, for example, what do I mean by this? Okay, <laughs> let me give you some examples. Why was, for I developed this in my book, maybe you even know it, that Welcome to the Desert of the Real. Why was September 11th such a trauma for New Yorkers and others? It's not, I think it's the wrong metaphor, which was sometimes used, Americans, or New York people at least, lived in their ivory tower, their relative <laughs> prosperity, and they simply didn't take into account the brutal life all around the world, you know, all the horrors, Congo, Somalia, blah, blah. And then, finally, that it was as if reality intruded that secluded space. I think it's the exact opposite. In what sense? Imagine everyday American, but I'm not going into America bashing here. The same is at least for Western Europeans and so on. Of course, you know about all the horrors, you know. But it's very important that you know about them mostly from TV and so on. And I claim that in your innermost, the way you perceive it, of course, you know it is real, it happens. But it's not part of your reality. It's absolutely fundamental that it's something that happens up there on the screen. And uh, what do you mean by this? For example, even uh, in even even with with movies, yes, we could complicate it because uh, I spoke. I get some talk. There were some gay people, and you know my sleep yesterday. <laughs> so what I want to say, sleep of Tom I mean, no. uh, what I, uh, I, and they told me two gay guys, but this is nothing tasteless. It's rather horrible. That once they visited a friend, these two guys, 
And so there, this was more than 10 years ago, it was still more a VHS, VHS cassette like that. They found there with a friend who told them, okay, use my apartment, a VHS where it says, keep it secret, don't use it. Okay, fuck it, if you find a VHS like that, it's the same as to say, immediately drop everything, put it in. But then they, 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 uh, they were sorry. They regretted terribly for doing it. Ah, 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 because it was a, how do you call them? My God, I'm getting sinai, it slipped out of my hand. How do you call movie? how do you call movies about murder, rape? Snap. 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 It was, uh, two guys were raping a girl. Okay, they said, it's tasteless, but so what? It's an acting movie, let's watch it, no? Eh. Then you know, you slowly notice, like first you seek a special effect, no. They cut off her. Here they opened the belly, blah, blah, and of course they told me like for practically half a year they couldn't look at the human body and so on, no. But uh, what I'm saying, then I, I tried, we talked about it a lot with these two guys, to complicate the image in the sense that, you know, in a movie, when people say, even some Marxists, this pseudo-Brechtian notion that identification is bad, like, you know, that bourgeois cinema is emotional, you know, this pseudo-Brechtian idea that bad bourgeois cinema is identification, you cry sentimentally, good critical uh, spirit is distanciation, you are aware all the time to, that it's just a film. Uh, I think, uh, for reasons into which I will not go now, I think that this is totally wrong. I think that, that precisely we never really identify in a film. You cry precisely because you are aware that it's not real. If some of you have a small kid, I mean this is the first lesson I learned about my small son. Let's say he falls, hits something, no? The moment he starts or she starts to cry, you know it's okay. That, you know, what you should worry if you just ask, oh, oh, you know, it's, that she cannot. Crying is already a, a release. It means it's okay. So, uh, what I want to say is that this is why it's interesting to see a couple of films where you identify with it, you cry, because you know it's just a film. No? But then you notice that at least some detail that they really did it. For example, did you see uh, uh, Apocalypse Now? You remember at the end in that crazy Marlon Brando Democratic Republic or whatever, no? That uh, they sacrifice some bull or cow. But then you see they are really, and how this, how this disturbs you. And that would have been for me the ultimate shock. You think you are watching a fiction and that you can identify, no? no? Okay, the first thing important here, and I think at a certain level this goes even in a more complex way, for our daily life. Like, uh, in order to identify with something, you must already be uh, in a safe distance. Okay, to go back now, why do I not uh, agree? with this general pseudo-Brechtian approach. You identify with it, it's bourgeois logic, you maintain a distance, it's progressive, okay, and so on and so on. Because I think that this precisely is, I'm returning to the example of September 11th, this is how ideology works very well in everyday life. You listen to news, today it's Syria, yesterday Somalia, whatever. And I claim no matter how much you emphasize it, no, it's something that happens out there. We like to give charity, but as some cynical guy, Ronnie Bauman, he is a very good French guy who is a charity guy, but not this type of corrupted corrupted charity guy, but the one who did case, he said he is well aware that we give humanitarian help, it's kind of a superstitious activity, you know, like if we give them something, they will remain there. It's basically a superstitious, to be sure that horror remains there, that it doesn't come 
too close. So again, my ultimate proof, I'm sorry if some of you know this line, but it fits here perfectly, of how there are limits of identification. That's why I hate her movies, but I would like to ask her, by her I think that French art pornography uh, woman director, Catherine Breillat, you know, how it works with her, namely, I'm sorry if some of you know this, are you aware, and this makes the nice Lacanian point against any authentic spontaneity, if you had the misfortune of watching hardcore porno, are you aware that these are maybe the most codified films that you can imagine? Okay, let me make you two points. I'm sure if you know some of them. One of them is Dean McKennell, who is kind of a, 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 a guy who works in semiotics, at the same time a, a theorist, something very strange, almost like a theorist of theorism. Don't ask mm -hmm. me how this works. Uh, he told me that he did a exploration of hardcore porn and how the expression of no, he didn't really focus on anything dirty, but the expression of woman's face, why she is banged, whatever, no? And he discovered, and then he contacted some, guy, some guys who do it, and he discovered, he even made them a semiotic square, and it's strictly codified. I know, now it's four expressions are codified. One is the, sorry, I don't take me serious, one is this, Simple ex oh, yes, uh, uh, this ecstasy, which is the least interesting, you know. Then the second codified expression is, uh, it's very important, it's a wonderful Freudian message. It's uh, the, many men uh, find this attractive, it's the uh, indifferent one, like the woman is yawning, chewing gum, like I don't care, the fuck off, you are doing something down there, <laughs> I'm bored by it, you know. And it's a wonderful message, because, uh, like, do you know that Russian diva Anna Netrebko, who sings, you know? Uh, okay, now she's a little bit too well-rounded, maybe, but the point is that she was, or is beautiful, and I love, you don't get it if you are not Slavic, her name, no? Not Sorry? Not blinking. Not? Netrebko, not blinking. No, is it not blinking, Coron? I didn't know, I thought it's, then I was wrong, but okay, se non è vero è ben provato. I thought it's, because even, isn't it even in Russian, to need something means treba. Trebko. Trebko, yeah, not trebko. And it's wonderful, her name means I don't need you. <laughs> and that's the ultimate fatal woman, you know, the message is, no wonder she is the cultist, ne trebko, this literally means I don't need you. I love to play with these games. Didn't I tell you a story? I, you know, I cannot resist an obscenity. Uh, in Slovenia, we had this wonderful joke, which I use when people accuse me that I'm not patriotic. You know, local idiots often say, oh, but you just write in English. Aren't you aware what beautiful language, what wealth it has? And I always say, of course, it's a beautiful language, Slovene. It allows you to get deep insight into things, blah, blah. And then my point, of course, is an obscenity, is that uh, uh, every Slovene knows why Mona Lisa is laughing. Now, this gentle smile. You know why? In Slovene, we are stupid, we don't have dirty words, we take them either from Serb, Croat, or from Italian, German, no? So, Mona is the Italian common word, it's rude, but not too rude for vagina, no? So, we know what is Mona, now comes, it's incredible in Slovene. Lisa, no problem, Lisa T, Lisa, it's literal, you don't have to change. Is it also in Croat? Yes, a uh, word to leak. No, is there any problem then why Mona Lisa is <laughs> has this gentle smile, you know? You can imagine, I got even some thread hate mail, you know, like uh, this didn't make... But, uh, okay, let's go back. So, uh, uh, what uh, pornography, yes. What I want to say is, this is the second qualified text. The third one is uh, the, what I, I call it, uh, instrumental technological expression, you know, it's uh, thin lips, like, uh, let's do it, we are in a hard work, you know, like, sex is hard work and you have to focus, it's strictly codified, usually like this, 
tight lips expression like it's hard work we are doing. And my favorite, of course, the last one, it's sex equivalent of that feminine gaze that I mentioned yesterday. Is this slight mocking laughter, you know, and like, haha, is this all you can do, you know, that man. But it's wonderful to see this, how strictly codified it is. And okay, the last thing, incidentally, there you also can see, now I'm becoming a little bit more serious. There you also can see why homosexuality and, sorry, how do you distinguish them? Because gay can cover both. What is the male version of lesbians? Gay, but gay is both, I never got it. Okay, uh, masculine and feminine homosexuality. How they are not structurally the same. It's not, on the one hand, you do it with the opposite sex, then you have homosexuality with two subdivisions. Uh, the proof, did you notice how, and it's uh, a very complex phenomenon, how in standard hetero hardcore pornography, it's part of the codified procedure that women play among themselves. You know, we have usually a masturbation, a bang here, a bang there, lesbian interplay, and then the big bang, whatever at the end. <laughs> no? But you see, uh, but it's absolutely prohibited to show, it would have been too obscene in straight hardcore, to show two men playing. Never, never. I mean, I know that I compromise you if I ask you, tell me a counter argument, this would be the admission that you are watching then so I have no idea, I know. But, okay, believe me, although I don't, I stopped watching them long ago, but uh, I'll tell you why I watched some of them recently. But no, they don't. So again, uh, 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 I claim the lesson is a very beautiful one. Uh, Lacan says somewhere something very, nice, and I think it's deeply true, very pro-feminist even, that uh, lesbians are the only true heterosexuals. Heterosexual in the simple sense that while you make love, you relate to the other, not just as a material prop, how should I put it, to state your fantasies, but the real neighbor, the real other. No? And, uh, because you must know this line of mind, maybe. You know how we usually define masturbation? Having sex with an imagined partner, as it were. You do it to yourself, but you imagine whatever you want. The best Lacanian inversion of this would have been that most of the time, uh, uh, real sex has the structure of a masturbation with a real partner. That is to say that basically you remain in your fantasy, you just use the other as a prop, as some plastic tool, even if this plastic tool is breathing or whatever, no? To, and it's there and to, uh, for, to, to stage your fantasies. Like it's clear, for example, in Hitchcock's Vertigo. This is absolutely clear. Scotty is masturbating with Madeleine and then, and then Judy. So, uh, Again, for Lacan, it's very nice theory. It's that the categorization is this one. Both heterosexual and male homosexual are what, what we call straight sex, are homosexual. The only true heterosexuals are lesbians. And then, of course, Lacan leaves a window open that in real love and so on, you can even with other sexual practices achieve it. Why? Because... Uh, Lacan is here, again, uh, uh, very uh, precise. There is another beautiful point here about Lacan, where he, uh, again, uh, he's formalized this one. He rehabilitates love here. And I'm also an incurable romantic here. I'm for Lacan. How, if you do sex, how do you go beyond this structure of masturbation with a real partner, with love, I claim. Which is why I claim that, that, uh, I, that love is not just some romantic coating or whatever, no? Like in this stupid sense of, 
we all want just to brutally fuck whatever, but to make it nicer, you talk about love. No, 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 love is more radical in a way. I absolutely believe in love itself. What does that mean you subjectify your, your partner? Yeah, okay. Now, I wouldn't for theoretical terms, because you know, subjectivization, you know why I, I don't, but yes, basically I agree with you. My problem with subjectivization is that it usually means reducing him or her to someone like me, to fellow men, you know. So, so love is when you cease to objectify your partner, not necessarily subjectify them, but you cease to... Or, yes, or, at, yeah, yeah, or, or at least the other is no longer just the mirror, the playground for your fantasies, you know. Uh, like, in, this, in the way I, I defined the neighbor as that abyss, you know, in love, you make love to the neighbor. The other is... Okay, but... So, let's go on. So, now comes my big sheet. I'm sorry if you know it, but I love it. I just cannot read. Uh, did you notice the basic point that I always like to make about hardcore pornography and the most depressive one? Did you notice... Okay, now I see from your faces. What is this guy talking about? I never heard about... Uh, did you notice in at least... But I will give you for the reasons why I think I'm right. At least 20 years ago, the, the product, how, okay, in a hardcore narrative, especially if it's a full movie, not just five minute sets, you need some kind of a stupid story. There must be a story to intro. Did you notice how incredibly, ridiculously, pseudo-comic, stupid this story is? And my firm conviction, is that this is a structural necessity. It's not that, you know, they are so stupid, commercial, they don't. In a way, what? Let, I mean, I'm sorry, I repeat here an old joke, but like, like when I was very young, I, I'm still traumatized by, I had the misfortune of encountering this, the stupidity of this story that uh, it is most stupid, you know, it's like, it's worse than sound of music, you're embarrassed to mention it. Like, a plumber comes home, the housewife is home alone, and he fixes the hole in the kitchen, which is leaking, and then, of course, the housewife said, I have another hole which should be fixed, can you also... And it's so, 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 <laughs> you know. You, it's so disgusting that you cannot help liking it, you know. <laughs> it's disgusting. But uh, I claim this is censorship. You know it won't sense. What is prohibited is both at the same time. To have a, let's call it naively, emotionally engaging story, which at the same time would have gone to the end. You know, like, imagine, I don't know, this is my fantasy because I hate the movie. Did you see how it's called that Meryl Streep and uh, Robert uh, Redford in Africa out of, Africa. Out, of Africa. Out, of Africa. out of Africa. Can you imagine that movie exactly the same it is, but when once they embrace, just ten minutes more, you know, like <laughs> seeing it all and so on. It doesn't work in that universe. So, you see, I think that here is the individual saying, okay, you can see it all, I mean, sex organs, but the price you pay is you shouldn't be immersed. You should be bombarded with reminders narrative reminders, how ridiculous, stupid this is, and so on and so on. Now comes the pro now come two problems. One is, what about Catherine Breya? Because, to cut a long story short, she tries to do, to simplify it, precisely this. But that's why I claim she remains marginal. It's unacceptable for the large public. You know, you cannot, I mean, for the for large majority, this prohibition still holds. Second reproach, the most brutal reaction I had this once was somebody told me, haha, you must really be out of sex, impotent, they were doing this 30 years ago, you know. So I asked them, okay, what are they doing now? And then I checked it. Maybe you know, it's something called, uh, called, uh, uh, how do they call it, it will, the term will come, uh, Okay, uh, it will come the term to me. It means uh, hardcore where they don't even pretend that it's a story, even the most stupid story. 
Sorry? Gonzo, Gonzo. Finally, someone with education. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what is Gonzo like, you know? They're fucking, the guy looks into the camera, I'm doing well, how, what should I do? You know, like, uh, it's to remind you all the time that this is taken. And again, I think this is censorship. You know, you see, the prohibition is even more radical here. They are afraid even of this totally stupid narrative. It, you have to be, and it, this is also why in avant-garde theaters and so on, I was always skeptical about this, you know how people thought you do a materialist gesture if you remind people that it's only stage performance, you know, like different strategies, like actors look directly into the public, address it, or what, what was popular in avant-garde theater, Berlusian, you do something that is too shockingly real, you know, like you kill a chicken, I don't know, something that reminds people, my God, they are really doing it. I claim this is not the Lacanian real, although, how is he called Foster, not Norman Foster, that Hal Foster, when he wrote the book Return of the Real, he is deeply wrong there. This Return of the Real is a return to reality, which is exactly the escape from the Lacanian the real. It's as if the real, in the Lacanian sense of that absolute real, the true core of trauma, is precisely in the fiction. In the fiction. And I claim this escapes into reality, you know, like, aha, we have to remind you, it's only a play, are precisely defenses against the real. The real is, the, the, the core of the real is precisely a story where you would too deeply immerse yourself. So, again, this stupid game of, intellectual game of, ah, uh, we are progressive, we fight, uh, alienation in the sense of sentimental identification, if we are reminded all the time of the production pro You know, when I was young, this idea was very popular. It was especially uh, popularized by Roland Barthes, you know, no? when in this, this was typical pro-Chinese progressive 60s, where he developed a parallel between Chinese painting and, okay, you can go into further domains, painting and preparing the food. He wrote a short text, I don't know where, Levi Ernolich, uh, no, sorry, Roland Barthes. You know how that as a rule in Japan, as a rule, again, not always, but the food is prepared there in front of you, you know. The idea being that they are not caught in this European mystification where the site of production is hidden. Their kitchen and then it's like a magic effect. You don't know how, but the beautiful tray plate with food is brought to you. You see the production process. And then the idea of Bart is that it, it's the same in, uh, how do you call it? It's the same in painting. You know this Chinese or Japanese, uh, 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 limit of my education, I'm sorry. Painting with brush on this extremely calligraphy. Safe. Calligraphy. Sorry? Calligraphy. Yeah, yeah. The point is what? That you must do it fast because the paper is so sensitive absorbing it that it simply gets the paper dissolved. Blur, no? So the idea is that in contrast to standard European realist painting, where you have the effect of reality there, transparent reality, you just see the object. There, part of the beauty of the painting is that gestures remain visible. So, okay, here Roland Barthes draws this parallel with, uh, with Marxist notion of work exploitation, claiming how they are the good guys, the production process is not obfuscated, you know why we in the West, bad representation, blah, 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 you know. It's not just fast. Sorry? It's not just fast. Yeah, 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 because you see, you have, you get one chance, first they put it, no? If you blew it up there, then it, you are, yeah, 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 that's true, yeah, 
Yeah. Uh, so, uh, uh, did you see the movie by Jean Kimo, who now unfortunately sold himself to the regime in China, The Hero? Which has a very na some nice scene comparing this calligraphic painting with with uh, with, with with fight, no? With uh, it's crucial, I think, this parallel and so on, no? Okay, but so let's go on. So what I'm claiming is that uh, uh, okay, let me tell you another story that maybe you know, but it's crucial here to give you precisely an idea of what for Lacan is the real. Lacanian real is not. There, out there, the way things really are, and then, you know, this would be more like some kind of a pseudo. Some people read Nietzsche in this way, strongly Nietzschean way, that the real out there is the brutal reality, too raw for us to perceive it, so we need symbolic screens to, to domesticate it, to gentrify it. No, no, the real is in fantasy. The real is the excess of fantasy, you know, in which film, I don't like it for different reasons, but I like the last scene. You get this very nicely. Did you see Stanley Kubrick, uh, the last one? Uh, Eyes Wide Shut? Yes, yes. Do you remember, even already that orgy, you know, the orgy scene, I like it, you know why? Because, I know, because, you know, the actor who plays a B role there, but the role with which I immediately identified that Croat Yugoslav actor, Rade Serbegia. Mm -hmm. He plays there that, yeah. that manipulator who is basically selling his daughter. I don't know, he's my type. You know? And I met him once. We are half friends, and he told me that <coughs> Kubrick explained this to him that the whole point of the orgy scene, you know, when finally Tom Cruise penetrated, is that it was consciously done in this, how should put it, totally aseptic, impotent way. Because it's not uh, this orgy where you eat. You are terribly disappointed. It's some kind of a totally fragile, almost immaterial ritual. But what I really like, let's go to the end, is you remember the very last scene in some uh, shopping mall where they, they, Tom Cruise, Nicole Kidman, they meet and, okay, they reconcile themselves and then these are, if I remember it correctly, the very last words of the film. Nicole Kidman tells him, I have something very important to tell you, what? Let's go home and fuck. Okay, since all the film is about getting caught into this fantasy, he imagines what she is secretly doing, you know, all that story about envy, excessive fantasy. Uh, of course, the obvious way to read it would have been they fantasized too much because they didn't have enough proper sex, as it were. So her idea is, let's have a good sex and we will not need fantasizing. Uh, my reading is exactly the opposite one. That It's not that real sex is the real thing and then you fantasize too much when you don't get it. Know that the truly subversive thing is fantasy, and that real sex functions there as a defense against fantasy. Like, literally, you are so obsessed with excessive fantasies that you use real sex to block, drown out the excess of fantasies. That's the whole Freud. You know, because, again, to give you the ABC, probably you know it, but it needs to be repeated. Uh, Freudian point of fantasy and so on is not, uh, or of sexual meaning, is not some kind of a stupid pansexualism, you know, like, whatever we are doing, we are thinking about that. You know, like, I don't know, I am, uh, no, uh, 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 I am, uh, uh, I don't know, intellectual activity, when you, when you attack someone, you're basically raping him, as if the secret meaning of everything is sexual meaning. No, Freud's point, if you read him carefully, is exactly the opposite one. He asks a simple question here, which is, okay, maybe true, maybe not, that whatever we are doing, we are secretly thinking about that. But what are we thinking when we are doing that? And the whole premise of Freud, and this is what Lacan aims at when he says 
there is no sexual relationship, is that that you never get pure sex. By pure sex, I mean it's just me and the partner. We don't need anything. We are here. You have to have a fantasy always. You have to imagine a third gaze, or which is why I think that uh, that people, when you open it up, and I'm not the guy for that. I'm terrified. Uh, people can do sex uh, exhibitionistically in front of others. I claim that in most of them you do imagine another, even if it's of course not a personal other, but it's an imagined gaze. So again, uh, <coughs> the, the role of fantasy for Freud is that what, you know, basically Freud gives a version of a wonderful insight by Levi Strauss, who wrote somewhere that he encountered one of those mythic tribes this time in North America, I think, who had a wonderful theory of dreams, of meaning of dreams. They said, they were right, they said, all dreams have sexual meaning, except sexual dreams, except those who are directly sexual, no? The idea is, what? That, uh, like, even, again, even when you directly make love, you need some fantasmatic scenario narrative to, uh, to sustain it. And you get here wonderful extreme examples, like a uh, small Viennese, Austria, Vienna, publisher, friend of mine, published private diaries of Ludwig Wittgenstein. He was writing them on uh, the front of uh, World War I. And you know, Wittgenstein was a little bit crazy, so he reports everything, his regular masturbation and so on. But what's more interesting is that he also reports what he was dreaming while masturbating. Not any gay orgies. He was dreaming, debating mathematical problems with fellow philosophers. No, that's what I claim through ethics. No, but no, seriously, what I, so let's put it like this. You know what's the Freudian, which, this is the reason why Freudian psychoanalysis is deeply anti, uh, how should I put it, against this logic that there is a normal sexual development, normal heterosex, and if you don't get it, then you have different perversions. No, for Freud, perversion is constitutive. In what sense? Uh, let's put it in very naive terms. Let's say you are a young boy or girl, and you are close to the door where your parents are, and you know, like, you... Uh, well, maybe from time to time, hopefully, uh, you hear some sounds and so on and so on. And then, fantasies, you try to imagine what goes on there, you know. And uh, here, David Lynch was a genius. You know where? Okay, the best known film... Blue Velvet. Yeah, Blue Velvet. You know what? My good friend, he's one of the great theorists, although he's neglected. The French guy, Michel Chion. He provided a wonderful reading of that scene. It's much, co much complex in the reality, but you remember that half rape, half I don't know what scene between Dennis Hopper and Isabella Rossellini. And Isabella Rossellini is a good girl, great actress. You know why I'm saying this? I have a friend who has a friend who knows her, and I was told that three months ago she was praising a book of mine. So, oh, he's a great actor, I said, no. <laughs> Seriously, no. You remember what, I mean, this is an ingenious reading by Shion. You remember what happens there, how uh, uh, the fa father figure, okay, uh, Dennis Hopper, you, know, you remember that weird detail, he puts on a breathing mask and, and other details like that. You know what is... You know what is the reading of Xion? That you should read this as a visualization of a fantasy. Imagine a kid listening and father doing certain things, and the kid doesn't know what is sex and imagines what is, has the father difficulties in breathing, you know, and uh, it's a wonderful reading. It's a much more complex reading even, because then, sorry, yes? All the examples you're giving, though, it seems are a, ma a male relation to fantasy. For Lacan, it's not a male and female, as you were saying before, with the 
the difference between hetero and homosexual sex have a different relation to fantasy? Uh, yeah, I don't want to go into that now. I admit, confess my male chauvinist bias, no, because uh, for Lacan, you know, uh, but Lacan's point is this. I will try to make it, it's a risky reading, that, uh, I put it like this, some people misread Lacan as if he is claiming men are fully in the symbolic order, woman is non-all, half out, and so on, and then some people try to read this in a Christian, Julia Kristeva, a pro-feminist way, like men are fully identified with ideology in, women have a distance, others read this in an anti-feminist way, like, Women too stupid cannot even fully integrate into the symbolic order. But Lacan is saying something different. What, uh, you know where I think, maybe I'm wrong, but I think it works. You have at its clearest, and here women appear much more, I don't like the word spiritual, but simply within the symbolic order. Difference, masculine, feminine position, although they are not single positions. It's much more complex. Read my big fat book, that chapter on sexual difference, where I try to go into it. Did you see Lars von Trier breaking the waves? Exactly right. What is the constellation there? The man, Stellan Scarfoteur, the guy, the man is pure, uh, pure, how to put it, male masturbating position. She tells her, Emily Watson, go out, fuck with guys, come to me, tell me about it, so the idea is he wants her to provide fantasies to masturbate or just to enjoy, you know, like this is simply using the other as fantasy screen to provide fantasies. But her position is a much more interesting one. Her position is that it's not simply as people claim painting her as some sacrificing benevolent girl who blah blah. No. She does for her the true substance of enjoyment is telling about it. She does it so that she is able to tell the story. And I think again, I'm sorry if this may appear secretly male chauvinist false mystified celebration of women, but I think only a woman can do this. And I will give you two other examples. Uh, one from a, immediately, one from a serious film, one from a uh, commercial film, but with a nice detail. Did you see, uh, uh, did you see, uh, did you see, uh, of course you did, uh, although I find it's also other Bergmans are better, Bergman persona. You remember, I think it's already one third into the film, even earlier, when, uh, who is the girl, uh, B.B. Anderson is telling uh, the other, Lee Woolman, the wife, a scene on the beach, there was an orgy. And the genius of Bergman was not to go, just words, no flashback. And everybody admits it's, this is what Lacan calls jouissance of the other. The other is language here. It's totally wrong to read Lacan as if saying women has access to some mystical primordial suite. No, 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 no. Only women can do this. To, and another film. It's a kitsch. But that specific scene I like. Uh, did you see that shitty melodrama with uh, Richard Gere and, uh, and uh, Diane Lane? Diane Lane is another thing. She was cute. Which one? Uh, unfaithful, I think. Yeah. You remember how when she does it, she or her husband with the young boy there in some lower lower head in Soho studio, whatever, which is always in Hollywood imagination the place to do these things. <laughs> so, uh, uh, do, do, you know, it's nonetheless nicely shot. You remember how it's shot. After doing it, she has to go to that suburban from Grand Station train. Uh, okay. It's they embrace, and then you immediately jump to the train, and the whole is given in a flashback comment. You know, it's as if what matters is not the stupid things she was doing there, but, you know, narrative memory afterwards, it's more, it's very nice, it's very nicely done, no? Again, so it's at this level that I would have been 
looking, which is why, okay, maybe I am a man here, which is why I always find it horrible during sexual acts, this idea of, you know, whispering obscenities and so on, talking. I'm here a brutal man. You talk when you talk, you do that when you do that. Like, when a lady once wanted to tell me something, I said, fuck you, we work now. No time for that. <laughs> fuck your femininity, you know, we don't do that. You know. <laughs> you know. Uh, okay, but nonetheless, uh, let's go on. Nonetheless, important. So that now, let me go to this role of the fantasy. And, yeah, because, uh, yes, uh, let me go on. So, uh, uh, with, yeah, you know the Freudian dream, you all know it, but I want now to read it, interpret it for the 20th time with an accent on this, you know, maybe the second, maybe even the first, the best known Freudian dream, the dream you remember when uh, father is dreaming that his son appears to him, horrible burning, claiming, father, can't you see I'm burning? There, Lacan does the stroke of a genius, how he interprets it. Again, very simple reversal, but it's efficient. Namely, Freud is still ambiguous here. What's the scene? You know the story, probably. Uh, father's, father is mourning his son who died unexpectedly of a heavy illness, and the scene is, this is reality. This is what really happened. It was in, in rather primitive, I don't know, some some uh, village, I don't know, society where they still follow this ritual that, how do you call it, the night watch, you know that somebody has to stay awake by the coffin. Okay, what happened is that the father was tired and fell asleep a little bit and then one of the candles on the coffin turned and it started to burn, the cloth covering the coffin and then the standard thing happened. You know, this wonderful logic of dreams when, where, when you are sleeping and some sound or in external disturbance threaten to disturb your sleep, you quickly construct a dream which includes that sound to be able to prolong your sleep. I mean, even to an idiot like me this happens, like a phone rings fuck you, you will not awaken me, you know, I construct a dream when somebody is calling me and so on, you know. But now, the, the question, and Lacan focus on it, the question of course is, why then do you awaken? Why do you nonetheless finally awaken? The vulgar explanation is because simply the external intrusion, disturbance, becomes too strong. Like, if I ring a phone, call you, you may prolong your sleep. But if I come, I like to imagine this, and kick you and grab your head, don't you see the fucking phone or whatever? You're like, I doubt if you will still be able to integrate this. Lacan has a much more elegant reading. That you construct the dream to escape from reality. I mean, to, to remain sleeping. But what you encounter in the dream is something much more horrifying than reality. Than your, it's precisely the real of a trauma. For example, here, can you imagine that obviously the logic was like this. The son probably died of some terrifying fever for which father felt guilty, who knows what other traumas were. So, father constructs the dream of the sun burning to include into the dream the smell of smoke and so on. But then, you know, what he awakens in this way is a trauma much more terrifying than the reality out there. So, he awakens, as Lacan puts it nicely, the father awakens to be able to really continue to dream, to avoid the real trauma which is precisely confronting the death of his son. And you know, this is what I'm aiming at with that final scene from uh, Ice White Shot. That, like, the real trauma is in the excess of the dream. And even I claim the trick of ideology is often this. Like, you, the trick, how does an ideology make reality sustainable, tolerable? so that it uh, 
constructs a fantasmatic real a horror which is more terrifying than reality itself. So that you can endure reality because you experience it as a... And here, Descartes is always here. In what sense? Let me give you another, maybe you know it, but it's crucial, I think, extra traumatic case. But don't be afraid. This is real tragedy, though. I'm not bullshitting with bad face jokes. From uh, uh, Primo Levi. It's from his, I think it's in the first one, Sequestro un homo, this is a man. He reports how he had again and again the same dream up there in that tourist place, Auschwitz or whatever, where he was on a long holiday for three years. Ago. That he had a dream there and then he thought this is his peculiar weird dream. But then he discovered that uh, most of the uh, inmates, prisoners, others had the same or at least a similar dream. Namely, a dream goes like this. I'm telling you this because you have exactly the same structure of dreaming, and then dreams, uh, the dream becomes so traumatic that you awaken into reality. The dream is this one. Uh, he was dreaming to, he was dreaming that the war is, it appeared at the beginning as a happy dream, no? He, the war was over, he returned home, and the dream starts with this wonderful, that's all you are dreaming about in a camp or what, of course. You are sitting behind the kitchen table with your family, you had a wonderful uh, 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 dinner with them, you talk, and then horror begins. You start to tell them in the dream how, how was, what was life in the camp how horrible it was. And then you know, first the child, then the grandmother, they get bored, blah, 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 and you remain alone. And this idea that you have no one to receive your message is so horrible that you escape into reality, you awaken in Auschwitz, you know. And let me give you another confirmation of this dream. I spoke, you know, when we had the terrible war, uh, uh, civil war, ex-Yugoslavia, early 90s, I spoke with some doctors, because many refugees from Bosnia came to Slovenia, and they all told me a similar thing. Take this horrible case, let's say that Serbs were not the only bad guys. Let's say Serbs raping Bosnian girl. The usual story was that they survived if they were lucky enough to survive, but uh, there were no suicides rarely or breakdowns there. They survive with this typical economy of, you know, I must survive to tell the story, to be a witness, no? What then happened is that they didn't find the big other to whom to tell the story. You know, it's all this disgusting male chauvinism jokes, oh, are you sure you didn't enjoy it a little bit, or, you know, all the vulgarities. Or people were, and uh, it's then that suicides or breakdowns happened. Not the rape itself, but when, and this is the true tragedy of what Lacan means by the big other doesn't exist. When you get it that you are alone with your suffering, that there is no big <coughs> other who will, yes? I can I can guess this also. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, but it's not. I agree with you because one has to be precise here. It's not just this primitive psychological isolation. It's isolation in this much more radical sense. You know, like we cannot survive without having some figure of the other, which is our not symbolic authority in any authoritarian sense, but just the space where we can deposit our message, as it were. You know, as we usually tell when you are screwed up, tell it and tell the story, even if it's a false one, and then, you know, this is, for example, you know what Goethe did with his boring novel, I don't get it, uh, Werther. He was terribly in love like that, but he wrote the story where he or Werther kills himself, and then he said, okay, I deposited my pain there, now I can go on and enjoy life. No? So, again, uh, uh, 
this, uh, this complexity, this complexity is, is uh, crucial here, but I am a sinner. But I promise, even if I die, you will get your fucking Buddhism tomorrow morning. Okay, <laughs> you know. But now, let's, yes, I will now, nonetheless, uh, guys, slaves, uh, yeah. get slowly ready. You have five to ten minutes. Okay, uh, for the clip. Namely, uh, uh, so the message of all this is how the way we experience reality is always within a fantasy frame and so on and so on. And again, I always like to use this here, I didn't yet this time, very vulgar metaphor with what I mean by this. Let's say I were now to take a knife, pick out one of my eyes and eat it. I claim that for a brief moment at least, you would have a brief experience of what they call realitätsverlust. Like, is this really happening? You know. It's too strong to be directly situated. But let me give you, maybe this means I'm a coward, a an example from real life. I remember when I did in 75, 6 military service. I did it pretty well afterwards and you would never have guessed it. Because people said, oh, you crazy soft philosopher, ha ha, I got a medal for model soldier and so on. <laughs> no, no, I'm a fascist privately. There has to be order shooting, <laughs> no problem. But nonetheless, it was so traumatic for me that I strictly remember how I was able to survive it, at least the first month, in totally compartmentalizing, how should I put it, my experience. I accepted the time in the army and that that's my world and simply private life remained a kind of a vague, I mean sorry, civil life outside, a kind of a vague memory not part of, you know, I related to it as some kind of a vague dream fiction, it was not my reality. And I remember how quickly, how quick the shift was. Like, once I got a short holiday, I returned home. Uh, my uh, barracks were like 100 kilometers from Ljubljana, so I had to take a bus, and on that bus already I erased the army. I almost didn't remember it, you know. How, and uh, here you can see the, here you can see the power of fantasy, how, and that's what Lacan means also with non-all, how, what really happens out there. We cannot ever fully include it into what we experience as reality. Back to September 11th, their reality of New Yorkers and so on was there, even if it's crime in New York, relatively prosperous, safe lives, and they fictionalized horror, Afghanistan, Somalia, whatever, in the same way I, and then, which is why, now comes the point, you will get it. I think what happened with September 11 bombing, it's not that they lived in an illusory world and reality intruded exactly the opposite. It was what they experienced as dream fiction that intruded into their reality. What had for them the status of you know, fiction in the libidinal sense, that of course, rationally, they know people are really dying in Afghanistan, but it's on the screen, you know, it's different reality. And that would be the psychoanalytic notion of reality. You cannot put it all on the same level, you know. You have a reality, but some things too strong or whatever have to be excluded, experience of fiction or, or whatever. In this sense, reality is always inconsistent. Uh, you need reality and then gaps in the reality which are filled in by fiction. So now, ha ha ha, after it, let's go to the movies. The first one, because what I want to show you in these movies, remember I begin with, I began with this gap between, uh, sorry, uh, this how, how to move between these two opposites. On the one hand, this simple heroic transparency, Nazis, whoever you want, they are bad guys, it's a just war, no problem. On the other hand, this rather superficial, I claim, pacifism, oh, the, you know, every killing is killing, blah, blah. The truly difficult thing is to have it both ways. To be aware, okay, 
It's a brutal war, we are right. For example, if we fight, I don't know, Hitler or whatever, the most, no? Or, so, no doubt there, no? Like, the message, but nonetheless, within this total identification with your cause, which is the just cause, nonetheless, you leave the space open for uncertainty, you know, in the sense of you have to be able to gain a minimal distance towards the narrative frame. Which is why I will show you simply one after the other from a wonderful, relatively wonderful, I think, French film from, I think it's 71 or 69, uh, by Jean-Pierre Melville, L'Armée des Ombres, The Army in Shadows, which is the story of a group of French resistance people, and it's precisely how it never puts in doubt the justice. But nonetheless, for example, two shots. The first shot will be, it's, I think, very well done, pretty dramatic, it's simple narrative background. The, the resistance group establishes that one of them is a traitor, a young guy. So they take him to a long house to kill him there. Then they discover that this house is not empty, that there is something, so they cannot shoot him, so they have to strangle him. And there is no doubt that they have to do it. But it shows so nicely their absolute trauma, embarrassment, you know, how to, you know, the disgust of it. And again, what I like is that it's not this nihilist, pacifist disgust or horror war. No, they have to do it, no question. But it's very important that you remain aware of the horror you are doing. And at the end, it's even a better scene. One of them, played by the wife of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Yves Montand, Simone Signoret, she plays a mature woman who is part of this group, uh, and uh, Germans catch her. And they leave her, they set her free. And the resistance learns why. They were able to identify her. Because violating the rules, but this is not a bad thing, because she was so linked to it, she had a photo of her daughter, who was in her late teens, always with her. So in this way, the Germans identified her, arrested the daughter, and gave her a clear choice. You know, you spy for us, you tell us resistant contacts, or your daughter goes to the Eastern Front to work in Brodel's four houses for German soldiers, till she will die there, being raped to death, whatever. So, what's the idea? Then, you will see the scene of resistance, meeting and debating what to do, and then enters somebody who in the movie is called Luc Jardy, and who is, for me, in real life, one of the mega heroic images, but you is in love with him all the time. The real model for that guy, the boss of resistance shame, is Jean Cavallès. He is a philosopher who was philosopher of mathematics and so on, pure, but at the same time absolutely heroic resistance fighter. The Germans, it's well known episode in 44, caught him, tortured him to death. The only thing name he named was his own name, you know. And this guy said, we must kill her, she is asking us to kill her. And then he, the guy, gives a clear explanation why, you will see, that she was in a difficult predicament. Either she betrays, then she doesn't want to do, or she loses the daughter. Now, the obvious solution would have been suicide. But, ah, Germans, as you learned before in the film, made it clear that if she kills this would be the easy way out. Now, if she kills herself, the daughter still retains her ticket to Moscow train. <laughs> so, uh, she gets it that it, she must die, but it must not be suicide, so that they will not blame the daughter. So, she tells the Germans that, that, uh, that they need to set her free, because the resistance is moving their addresses all the time. She had to reestablish contact to be able to inform the Germans, blah, blah. They leave her, they let her free, and the philosopher reads this as, you see, she is asking us to kill her. As the only way to achieve, at least even if she loses life, two things. Not to die, 
I mean, sorry, her daughter to survive, but at the same time not to betray. But then it's a wonderful detail. When people, the group decides this, two remain, played by Lino Ventura, the main hero of the film, and this philosopher, and Lino, the, the guy played by Lino Ventura, the hero of the film, asks the philosopher, but are you quite sure that this is true? And the philosopher said, no, it's just a hypothesis. You know, like, how you have to... I like this radical logic, you know. You have to act, you have to decide. There is no easy way out. But even if you have to do horrible things, this is for me the true ethics. Not to escape, oh, I don't kill, it's horrible. No, fuck it. There are situations where effectively not killing, I can well imagine a situation of a rapist, blah, blah, or a criminal killing where, I can imagine very easily a situation where when you are not ready to kill someone, is an act of betrayal, in the sense of, you know, causing many more deaths. But if this would be my ethics. You are fanatically dedicated to the cause, but you are aware of the horror. So let's have these two clips, please. Uh, let's and pray to God, if you are religious, that it will work. Uh, can you make it a little bit larger? No. Oh, yeah. Okay, okay, got it. Even. And sound, sound.
Of him because the guy, I like this honestly, the philosopher, she wanted to be there for her to see him, like assuming the act, not, oh sorry, it's just the guy, you know. Uh, no, again, I'm not saying this is, ah, we can go on, don't even bother with the life, prepare the next one. My God, one cannot even rely on slaves today. They, 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 <laughs> sorry? They don't need them like they do. They don't, yeah, the, uh, yes, yeah, 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 yeah. You should do. Let's not get lost in this madness, you know. Sorry. What I wanted to say is that, again, I'm not saying this is a mega great movie or whatever, but I really don't remember anywhere finding in such a clear way the authentic ethical position. Because you have ways to make the opposition between good guys and bad guys softer. You know, like you have in some movies, I don't know, <coughs> the good German who is not the killer or blah blah. But this is not the same here. Nobody says that the young boy was not a traitor, blah blah. And I think, do I remember it correctly? I think that it, it's my fault. Bad DVD. I think that there also there was another jump. It's very nicely just before they strangle him. Lino Ventura, the guy Gerbia, or the guy tells him, don't worry, you will not suffer, we will try to kill you, not, and so on. Uh, so again, the ethical coordinates are the same, absolute, you know what I mean? But you assume the disgust, the horror of what you are doing, yes? How would you articulate the ethical subject's relation to certainty? To? Uh, to the, the, the subject's relation to certainty. A certainty, this is, this is the Lacanian movie. It shows very well how 
No, the, the certainty if you wait for sorry. Yeah, please. if you wait for certainty. No, if you wait for certainty, it never arrives. Uh -huh. You must always the decision is always precipitation. You have to make a move, you know. This is I'm so sad we cannot go into this because Alain but Alain incidentally Alain likes this movie because it makes this is what Alain <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. So it's incredible how today I read even in an analysis it's so identified with hardcore porn that to see a woman dressed up as a nurse, nobody has an association with hospital, you know. Everyone thinks this is hard. So why don't you ladies here who are nice come here to make it like we are dressed as nurses <laughs> <laughs> much nicer sorry i cannot resist tastelessness as you go, go no but what i mean is that you know this is what but you aim said when he says yes decision act but he uses this french term for say for such you know don't enforce the real B maintain that gap he even used, I tend to agree with him, one wouldn't expect it from him, the term totalitarianism. You know, that in totalitarianism, this gap disappears. Like, in a totalitarian movie, the first murder would have been shot, probably they would show the traitor as sleazy, evil guys. But, you know, like, uh, the situation would be totally, totally uh, transparent. But again, I hope you got my point. I'm sorry I repeat it for the third time. My point is that it's uh, uh, that the ethical coordinates are no less absolute. That's my point. The message of film is not we humans are fighting our struggles, but it's all relative, you know, like kind of a relative. No, the ethical coordinates remain. They are absolutely right to do what they do and so on. And I'm sad that I don't have time because Precisely this is what I also wanted to do, to go into this logic of precipitation where even Alain, but you refers to Lacan, his seminar on psychoanalytic act, the idea is a very nice paradox, is that every act is at the same time too late and too early. There is no proper time. If you wait for the proper moment, by definition, it never ar arises. You know whom I quote here? Uh, Long ago, but now I will go in my next book more in detail. Rosa Luxemburg, the one you know who, you know, freedom is freedom for those who think differently. Here I have problems. I'm a totalitarian. I prefer the version freedom is freedom for those who think exactly like me. <laughs> but nonetheless, she says something wonderful. In her polemics to social democrats, against social democrats, Bernstein and so on, she is... Uh, she tries to argue against the typical revisionist argument, let's not try the revolution now, it's too early, you know, let's wait for the mature circumstances, blah, blah. And she says something simply true. She says, if you wait for the right moment, it will never arrive. Because you have to begin too early at the wrong moment, and through the very failures of these precipitous too early attempts, you become mature enough for the right moment. You know, and it's something like, like in every act, of course, you wait, and you always wait too long. So always there is a delay. Every act, every authentic act, that's the paradox. It's at the same time too late in the sense that you are under terrible pressure, and you know, my God, it's already too late, let's do it. But at the same time, paradoxically, from the standpoint of certainty, it's too early. What I wanted to do, but will not, is this. Do you know that par logical paradox exploited by Lacan about three prisoners? You know, there are three white heads, two dark heads, and prisoners see only what, other, what the other two guys, what they have. And then, you know, some sadistic uh, chief of prison tells them, the first one who guesses from the, looking at the other two what color is his head, he will be free. The problem is there are prisoners, no, there are two dark and one, sorry, 
three white and two black hats. And it's clear what Lacan is aiming at. Like, if I see two black hats, I immediately know. Of course, since there are only two... Well, if I see one black and one white, then I can also quickly arrive at the result, you know. I say, okay, if I were to have also black hat, one of those two would immediately guess that I have a... that he has the white hat. So I must also have the white hat. The problem is what happens if I see two white hats? And okay, you can easily, but it, exactly through a certain logic of delay. It's a very simple exercise. No, not so simple, I think. And uh, now I will tell you a secret. In a chapter that I'm finishing now, I did something so disgusting that I know I will provoke critics to say, uh, my God, it's so disgusting. I retell this story, but I just change conditions a little bit. Think really dirty and you will imagine it. The teacher, my God, it's so disgusting. It's a feminine prison and the boss of the prison gathers three ladies and tell them, you will be around the table leaning forward and I have here three white guys and two <laughs> black guys and you will be each fucked from behind and you will see only which color of a guy is fucking the other two and the one who guesses first, oh, I'm fucked by white or black. I cannot even imagine, but I like to provoke what will come. Okay, going back to pornography, what I want to finish with is, maybe some of you already know it, is don't be afraid. It will be hardcore, but maybe you will not even see one of absolutely most depressing films that I've ever seen. It's a movie about hardcore, but the director, some Sigoni, I don't know which, which I got this from my friends at Cayeli Cinema, did this. He approached a director of hardcore movies and tell him, can I do something? Shoot you while you are shooting movies, but you know, from a little bit of distance, you know. Just use, like you see how the poor girls prepare themselves, are born, and uh, just that's what I'm saying. The effect is almost the same as the one I think I already improvised it here to some of you. Like how the, here you see the power of fantasy in sex. You know, like you make love, but if the phantasmatic support of sex is lost, all of a sudden you can have this stupid feeling. I hope it didn't happen too often to you, to me it did. Like, what am I doing this, making this stupid gesture? In a kind of a, like, yeah. you know, you, you experience it and everything is lost, you know. And here it bombards you. It's just the importance of frame. Okay, let's have to finish just a little bit of this. Let's see. I even didn't know where we were. Jump just a little because I want to see some real action. <laughs> 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 then just jump then. Yeah, 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 yeah. Look, 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 look. How nothing is happening here.
this is just sex that with true love it would still work. Maybe I'm wrong. Okay, fuck it, that's life for today. <laughs> Tomorrow we will do some more movies, but I wanted to do at least uh, something. And the guy must be a Lacanian because the title of the film, now when it was released, is Il mia padre rapport sexuel. Yeah, yeah, there is no sexual relation. Yeah.